the meters are moving, so that's usually a good thing that uh, we have. Technology is working. Check, check, check. All right. On our call this morning, I'm excited to have our guest. He's uh, Miles Anthony Smith. Uh, Miles is an ambivert and a serial specialist. He's held senior executive leader posi leadership position. Let me start that over here again. We're only two seconds in. Our guest today is Miles Anthony Smith. Uh, Miles is an ambivert and a serial specialist. He's held uh, senior leadership uh, positions with businesses and nonprofits for over 15 years. And currently, he works for Mr. Rekey, uh, America's largest residential locksmith, and he's the uh, director of vehicle donations and digital marketing. He's uh, got a Bachelor of Music, Composition, and an MBA. Uh, and uh, he's also the leadership of uh, multiple books, uh, including Why Leadership Sucks and uh, Becoming uh, Generation Flux. And uh, he and his wife and their three children live in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Miles, welcome to the program. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate having me on and look forward to our conversation here. Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. I uh, uh, Coming up on the, uh, well, it's the, the new year. And uh, always seems like a, a good time to kind of slow down and and uh, kind of take stock of what is and and uh, if there's anything that you're wanting to change, this might be a good time to uh, reassess and and refocus, maybe resharpen the the uh, the tools. And I thought uh, having you on here might be a great opportunity for our get or for our listeners uh, to uh, uh, take a look, take stock, and uh, kind of think about things and see if. Uh, you know, if there is something they wanted to change uh, with respects to uh, their leadership skills or, uh, well, give them, give them something to pause and think about there. But uh, before we jump into that, uh, if you could do uh, myself and, and the listeners a favor and tell us a little bit about your background and, and uh, how you kind of navigated your path uh, to this point. Well, you know, you touched on... Uh, one thing in my bio, the serial, the concept of the serial specialist. And um, it's something that I really wrestled with throughout my career. And I suspect that other people have as well. Um, you know, many of us have lots of different talents and skills and abilities that we can apply in our work life, whether that's as, you know, having a job, whether we're consulting, whether we're doing freelance work, any number of things as the economy is continually changing the job market and what it what it defines as a job or what it defines as our career. Um, but um, like many of your listeners, you know, really our life is a bit of a journey in our career trying to figure out where we fit, where is my best skill set. And so for me, uh, I was very fortunate at a young age to have had a senior leadership role um, of a small business um, and really cut my teeth that way, learning somewhat through the, hard, the school of hard knocks and somewhat just learning from other people that I knew and uh, that I considered to be you know, successful in leadership. And uh, it's really the impetus of why I wrote uh, volumes one and two of Why Leadership Sucks. I really wanted to share that journey of the frustrations, the ups and downs, the challenges that we go through through and way that there is in leading well through servant leadership well you, you um you touched on a couple of things there that i i think uh at least my experience when i look around and kind of uh survey the landscape or or just think of of clients and, and just small business in general and uh, uh navigating the leadership in small business um i think uh many times when i look around and i see small businesses, I usually see the owner is the uh, top salesperson there. They, uh, they started the business because they were the top salesman for somebody else, uh, decided to go out and do it on their own. And, and, uh, it works for them. Uh, but leadership may be a stretch if, if you were to compare to an actual, uh, a plan, a model, it's, it's usually, how can we sell more, uh, do your job, you know, uh, kind of thing. I, I I'm kind of curious, uh, Tell, can you tell a little bit about your your uh, early position there? I, I I mean, small business and leadership are not always uh, synonymous there. 
No, it's very true, and um, I think it's challenging. You know, most, as you mentioned, most entrepreneurs who go into business themselves are specialists in some area, and they want to take that skill that they have. Usually there's a sales component that they're good at in that business, and they turn it into a business instead of working for somebody else. Well, what they realize when they jump into it is that it's a lot more complex than just taking the the type of job that they had before. It isn't just as easy as, as now I own it so I can make more money from it. But there's a lot more complexity to it, um, not only just the operations of accounting and finance and uh, not to mention the operations of running the business and making sure that you know jobs get done, whatever products get shipped, whatever your, your service or product business is, that things happen efficiently, that customer service is a top priority, that people are inspired and want to work there. Um, you know, that's just, that's just uh, t- uh, skimming the surface, so to speak. There, there are so many things that you have to be aware of in a small business. And I think the real reason it's so challenging for small businesses to have great leadership is that in a smaller company, it's harder for the organization to, to afford one person to be able to really do all of those things. And, it, and it's even harder for to find somebody who's skilled and adept at doing that for a small business. But I think the, the, the thing we need to keep in mind is that we're all on this journey. We're all learning, or, or we all can learn, if we are trying to improve our leadership skills. And I think your listeners, because they're listening to this this podcast, are wanting to improve their skills. And so we need to learn from each other's stories, you know, successes and mistakes, and really understand that, that both of those are part of the journey of life and of us growing and becoming a better leader. And every one of us, um, even if you're not you know, skilled or, or naturally inclined to be a leader, every one of us can improve our leadership skills, whether we lead an entire team of people um, or we lead ourselves or our family um, or other groups of people. <laughs> Well, and and I, I certainly uh, would concur with that. I'm, I'm, I, um, you know, I think that's again, uh, the new year always kind of brings hope or whatever that you, you know, if there's something you meant to do last year that you didn't get done, or there was a, a shortcoming or or some sort of a an opportunity missed or or something that you're you're working hard at that you know there's a better way kind of thing. Um, it, 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 it clearly, I mean, I think everybody would be, uh, well, it should be an opportunity to, to take stock in that. Um, I'm curious on, you know, your, your, your book on why leadership sucks. I mean, first of all, the, the topic is, uh, certainly provocative. I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what inspired you to title the book that way? Cause I, and you're coming from a leadership position, uh, can you can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, you know it's certainly tongue in cheek. Um, <laughs> I I can tell you that uh, when I started writing the first volume of Why Leadership Sucks almost five years ago now, um, you know I don't think I had the title initially, but it it, it exemplifies. It, it condenses and distills everything that I wrestled with and still wrestle with today, um, you know, into one compact statement. And it is a little bit of a, like you say, a provocative title. I think some people may be drawn to the title because they think, well, you know, my boss sucks and he's terrible or she's terrible at leading us. And, um, you know, that's why leadership sucks. And, and I think some people that, you know, take a look at the book at first, think I'm just railing on bad leadership um, or pointing out bad leadership. And while there's an element of that we can all learn from poor leadership, that's not my intent to embarrass or point out people's flaws because we all have those flaws, maybe different flaws, and we can more easily see the flaws in our leaders than we can see our own flaws many times. So, you know, it's, 
it really was born out of that frustration and challenge and pain. And for me, the realization that I've come to is that that's part of the journey. Um, it's part of, of us being in charge. We have to put up with, um, that doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable. We absolutely do. But the way in which we hold people accountable, um, uh, being an overbearing leader, um, is, is really important to being successful in the long term, over a long term career, not just one job or one company. Uh, but, and really these days, you know, you talk, we talk about the changing economy. That's, that's really what it's going to take. Even if you own your own business, that may not necessarily be the job or the business you're going to be in 10 years from now with business cycles moving faster and faster. The pace of change is going uh, increasingly fast and we're going to, and part of that is we've got to learn to adapt our businesses and our organizations, provide the good leadership. Um, or we're either going to lose the business or we're going to lose our employees. <clears throat> I want to uh, kind of go back there. The, the, um, the audio was garbling just a little bit, and I, I was halfway tempted to say let's rewind there, but let's, let's see if we can power through here. Um, in in the your experiences as a leader, and, and you were kind of sharing and, and – uh, Kind of, you know, the from the inside point of the the leader outward, what you know, why, or at least what I've taken from the what you were saying was, uh, instead of it being the uh, <clears throat> the uh, point of my my boss, he's a he sucks, uh, what a horrible boss he is. This is going to be a great book. I can't wait to read. I could have written this book, uh, but more from the from the uh, the leader's position and, and the kind of the challenges of being a leader. Uh, was kind of what I was, what has taken what you were, what you were uh, speaking to, um, and, and I'm kind of curious. It, it, you know, from a from a standpoint of if the if there are so many challenges at, at leading, um, you know, is there a is there a reluctance to lead? Do you see? Is there uh, based on all of that, or you know, is it is it uh, you know, is it, is it, could, could it be titled uh, leadership sucks and I don't want to be one or, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could write a follow-up title for that. But, uh, um, no, you're, you're, you touch really on the pain point. I think many leaders, many of us, including myself, when we go into that first leadership position, we have certain preconceived notions about it and most of them are wrong. Some of them are right, but a lot of them are wrong. Um, and that's just because of what our culture and society really paints as the picture of leadership, that you get to be in charge and you get to tell people what to do. You know, you have the power, now you have the money, may have the fame, depending on the size of the organization, uh, but you have more notoriety. Uh, but you have that and you have equal parts of more stuff to deal with. So some people do get out of, a leadership role very quickly because they don't like to deal with all of that stuff. Um, but I believe we need people to step up and lead as servant leaders. And by servant leadership, I don't mean weak leadership or just letting people do whatever they want or getting, you know, they can you just continually miss deadlines and not get, get work done. Um, but we need smart, wise leaders. We need people to step into those roles and assume that 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 role and that authority in, in such a way that's going to serve that group and that organization is going to help them grow as people. It's going to challenge them at times when they need some you know some accountability to hey, you know, in this area you have some weakness and I need you to do this differently to grow in that. Um, and really, it's, it's, it's more rewarding to approach leadership that way than it is just as a dictatorial, top-down, do what I say and get it done kind of a leadership. So to me, there, there's a lot of hope there. It's just understanding, and I wouldn't say resigning ourselves to that, the challenge and the pain, but understanding that that comes with the territory and that it's worth 
doing because we're making a bigger impact, not only in the organization, but in the lives of the people that work there and in the lives of the customers um, or people that we serve in a nonprofit. Um, kind of more of a holistic uh, view, if I'm, a, if I'm hearing what you're saying, as opposed to uh, uh, get your task done. Uh, am, I, am I hearing you right? Is that kind of your your point there with the, uh, I mean, it's, it, it makes sense. I mean, I, I totally, uh, uh, subscribe to that is that there's, there's more than just the job at, at hand. I mean, there's usually something going on in one's personal life. That's probably got some sort of a, uh, grab on their attention and, and, uh, depending on what it is, um, you know, could have a full-time grab or, you know, um, they, they may not necessarily be, uh, that attentive at work there. Um, how- you're abs- well, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> and, you know, just to add to that, I think it's important for us to understand the context of our work and that there's more meaning and more impact that is happening in our work environment and in our daily lives for that matter than we realize if we don't get so focused on the details and the minutia. And while details are important to running any business, especially a small business, there are certain, even small details that can be really crucial that, that just have to be right in order to deliver the results to the customers, whatever, you know, there can be an infinite number of applications for that concept. But um, while it's important to follow those details and make sure that we get things right, it's also important to step back and realize we're leading people. And before you throw me out and just say, well, Miles is just some (laughs) hippy-dippy, you know, let's just love everybody kind of a leader, uh, that's not the kind of leadership I'm I'm talking about. Um, But I am talking about the fact that many of us as leaders get, and I I at times get this way too, we get sucked into those details, we get sucked into that minutia, and we miss opportunities like you just pointed out, Darren. I can't tell you how many times when I've run into an employee issue, you know, either employees fighting with another employee or they're not getting their work done or maybe they were efficient before and now they're not or something's going wrong. I can't tell you how many times when I've just sat down with them, even for five or 10 minutes and said, you know, hey, this is going on with so-and-so or, you know, your, your work is just, you know, this is not as good as it once was before. What's going on? Is there something going on in your personal life? And, you know, as leaders, we, we're not going to be a counselor. We're not licensed to be a professional psychological counselor. However, uh, there are times where we need to take that opportunity and stop, recognize what's going on. Just take the few minutes. It's not that long, really, to and, and, and show them a little bit you actually care. Uh, about maybe what's going on in their life. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't need to address the issue that's going on at work. You still need to do that. But take take a few minutes and understand what's going on and then address the issue. And many times, not all, but many times, you'll find that that will help them move past that or at least push that that personal issue to the side so that they can get back to focusing on work. And if not... You, know, you may need to refer them to a counselor um, or suggest that they get some, you know, get some professional help um, so that they can better perform in, in their job. Right. No, I, I was uh, re- recently having a conversation with a client and there was a, uh, there was a merger of a couple of uh, organizations and he was uh, the leader and, and, um, he was basically commenting on essentially what you're saying there is, is the, what, what he didn't realize was the power of his just taking uh, a few minutes, you know, walking the halls there, stopping in somebody's office there and, and, you know, taking the five minutes and just like how appreciative they were of that a uh, little bit of time. And, and uh, you know, whether it was a problem or just trying to connect with the, the staff kind of thing, it was, it was meaningful uh, to the sports staffs. Uh, from the support staff's position and, and, and for him to recognize that, I think, um, you know, again, we're, we're, the, the premise is, is that the, the leader understands the role 
of the leader and, and trying to, to get the, the organization to move forward as opposed to I've got my own problems, you take care of yours kind of thing, which I've seen, you know, many times and in, in you're, you're uh, a leader in title uh, only as opposed to, you know, a, a, some, a leader that somebody would follow uh, kind of thing, you know, and I'm kind of curious actually, as I say that, it, do you have any kind of uh, parameters that you recognize as leadership qualities that, that one must have in order to be a, an effective leader? Well, there, you know, there really are so many different facets of leadership that are important. Um, and none of us are perfect at all of them. We're all, again, like I said, on that journey. Uh, but, I think many of us, including myself, that are drawn to leadership are drawn to it because of the, maybe that not, power is probably not the right word, but something along those lines where, you know, we feel like we can make a difference by leading a team of people. That takes a certain, a certain amount of hubris or pride to believe that, hey, I can get up in front of people, not only talk and communicate the vision of where we want to go, but then I can inspire and motivate these people to a particular goal or vision that's you know that's not something that everybody wants to do so those of us who are drawn to that for whatever reason that we're drawn to the leadership role and maybe it's just because we want to make more money and we think it's going to in increase our career um, while i do think most people can become a better leader i do think there are some people that are more naturally inclined to leadership. So, um, but, but even if you're not naturally inclined, you can still be a better leader. Um, as far as the specific qualities uh, that you want in a leader, you know, I, I think it, it, it centers around something you kind of touched on earlier, which is ultimately to inspire people to a goal or a vision. And I know that may sound simple, but there are many leaders in that what you call positional, they have positional authority, meaning they're the person in charge. And because they're in charge, they get to tell people what to do. But that only gets you so far, um, not only in your organization, but even as you network with other people in your career and in your life, that only gets you so far because it's a it's really a tit for tat kind of a quid pro quo, quo approach rather than um, something that is, is much larger than that, that really, if you get people, if you can inspire people towards that vision or goal, they will take a bullet for you. Uh, metaphorically speaking, um, they will go much farther in their jobs. They will more, they will perform at a higher level. They will excel um, in their effectiveness. And I've seen that in my own leadership and in others as well, uh, both on both sides of the fence, where, where you, know, you have a leader that um, about the team, as you kind of mentioned, um, and really demonstrate not only about them personally, but about to do their job better, not by telling them, but by asking them questions and understanding then to be understood, as Stephen Covey um, has taught us in one of the seven habits, um, really taking that approach of, I'm not necessarily, I'm a smart person as a leader, but I'm not always going to have the best idea or the smartest idea in the room. Um, and having that, that level of humility, I think, is a prerequisite to being able to inspire a team of people. No, that's, that's, uh, well said there. Um, and you mentioned something, uh, uh, about, uh, asking questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious on, on your, um, your thought on that. Cause I, I think one of the things I'm realizing as I continue to, to go forward and I'm looking for more answers is that, that the notion if you want a good answer ask a good question uh kind of thing and you know i i think that a, a well-framed question does take a lot of thought if you're you know if you're really looking for 
uh, somebody, if you're looking for somebody to dig deep and try and try and figure out why things aren't or, or how to make things better, uh, somehow to get them invested in the, in the, in the situation, um, you know, as opposed to why, why are you doing that? Uh, although sometimes, sometimes why is a good question, uh, you know, as opposed to, um, and I guess where I'm really, really trying to frame this or, or I'm trying to, uh, get out here is the, the, the power of asking a question as opposed to giving a, a command that makes sense with a, you know, to, to engage the other, other party there. Absolutely. And I think that how you ask the question, not only the words you use, but the tone in which you use to ask the question will determine to a large extent the answer that you get. And many times, I would say most times, when a leader asks somebody who directly or even indirectly reports to them about a specific situation, ask them a question, they're going to get a rose-colored answer. <laughs> Unless, and this takes time, unless that leader has built up trust with that person, where that person feels like what I say and how I respond to that question isn't going to be used against me personally. Um, and to me, that is, that is the real challenge and really the, the leadership dance that we, we all do every day. Um, is asking questions and trying to get to the root of the issue. So for me, I think I've become a better question ans asker um, as I've done that more. And a lot of times it just takes probing a little deeper. That doesn't mean intrusively, but you know, somebody gives you a specific answer, you may need to ask a little bit more, delve a little bit deeper into that. You know, can you show me? why that is that way or show me the reports that you're looking at because many times after and i know others too um that answer is filtered through that person's personal life as well as to do the business and that may not always be accurate and as a leader we need as accurate information as possible in order to lead and guide our organizations because if we have inaccurate or somewhat inaccurate data um, or perceptions about what is really going on we can't always make the right decisions to correct course especially in a crisis situation so there um, you know things are really going poorly as a leader those are the most critical times because we've got to figure out what's going wrong and what we're going to do about it quickly uh, so that we can, you know, keep the, keep the organization going in a positive direction. Um, but knowing and being able to really discern how people are responding to those questions. I mean, that, that takes time and experience and, uh, and, and really an understanding of somewhat of human psychology. Um, and so, you know, I, I think every leader needs to not have it, not necessarily have a psychology degree, but understand and be interested in um, psychology of people and, and how people may respond because they think that you want to hear a certain answer a certain way. And I've told people that work for me many times, don't tell me what you think I want, what you want me to hear. Tell me how it really is, good or bad, ugly, doesn't matter. We'll deal with it. We'll figure it out. Just don't don't sugarcoat it, because then that could be very problematic for the organization. But the only way that I can say that and people respond to that is because I've built trust with them. They know I have their back. They know I'm going to um, lead them in a in a way that's not going to shame them or chastise them for every mistake that they make and that we're going to learn and grow together. No, I, I think that that all makes sense. I'm curious, um, on, on, uh, you know, leaders, uh, what, what's your view on kind of mentorship? Um, you know, having a, 
you know, if you're, if you're trying to raise your game, um, you know, seeking out a mentor or, or, you know, how, how does one go about raising their, their, uh, skill set to be a better leader? Is there, is there a, uh, a path that you prescribe to, you know, or can you speak to that? Well, I think before you get or approach somebody to be your mentor, um, I think you need to have a clear understanding or a clear idea and be able to express that to somebody that you think could be a mentor, but also understand, um, you know, that, that requires a lot of time commitment from that potential mentor, as well as the mentee, the person who's wanting to be mentored. That is, and it, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot, if you want a formal coach to help you, um, that's something that is time consuming for both parties. It's, I think it's very worthwhile um, to have that person who's been there, done that and can coach through a lot of those circumstances, but it requires a certain level of commitment on both parties part. I think many times when we have that frustrating situation or we got into a place where we feel stuck in our career, um, you know, we want to jump at the next best thing and, you know, I need a mentor, or I need this or that program and um, I think there absolutely can be a place for that but we need to um, understand it takes a commitment and know exactly what we want to get out of that that coaching situation and having that clearly defined on both sides of the aisle you know will make a successful uh, mentorship uh, program I think you know not to promote myself but I think a great starting point is with leadership books and you know I've written a couple of books on why leadership sucks uh, a lot of stories um, that you can learn from and then really a lot of this is about taking what you've learned in either in a book or in school or from a coach or mentor and then applying it because everything that I talk about in my books um, you know is somewhat situational and so you know, everything, I can't prescribe a, you know, the exact remedy to your situation every single time uh, because you have the human element to leading people. That's what makes it so hard and so challenging. Uh, but I also think that's what makes it interesting as well if we focus that, um, you know, focus our minds in the right way that this is, this is fun and interesting and intriguing so uh, really there are, there are many ways to grow that leadership um, and, and I don't think there's really any one right or wrong way to do it either. Got it. Yeah, I want to circle back to your, your books and, and uh, you know, I was kind of curious, you, you wrote volume one and volume two of uh, Why Leadership Sucks. Uh, why, uh, what was the, the emphasis for the uh, volume two? Well, I just had more to write. <laughs> Frankly, after I wrote the first book, um, that was about, well, I started writing five years ago, and four years ago it came out. And then, you know, I just had more stories, more information that I wanted to share, and I didn't feel like the first book was done. I mean, when I wrote the first book, I thought, well, this is my leadership book, and I'm done, and, and I'll really on leadership, and... I've just had more time in life and more other different leadership experiences, uh, different aspects of it that I wanted to to talk about. And, and now I even think I don't have a third volume yet, but I think I'll probably have more stories and more information to to share in a, a volume three or maybe four or five. Who knows? But um, you know, I, the real impetus for my books um, truly is to share what I've learned and the challenges that I've been through. Hopefully you can laugh at them. <laughs> I can laugh at most of them now <laughs> at the time, not so much because um, they are painful. They're, they're frustrating. Um, you can go through really highs and lows all the time. I mean, leadership is lots of ups and downs. It, it just, it's, it's just comes with the territory. Um, and it, um, I think, understanding that and embracing that not just resigning yourself to that fact but embracing 
the challenge as well as the, the fun stuff too. And recognizing, hey, this is part of the journey. There's going to be ups and downs. We're going to get through it. I got through it before. I can get through this next, you know, big challenge in my way. Let, let me uh, let me ask you. I, I um, uh, your your generation flux. Uh, I think we in, in the beginning we talked a little bit about things. You know, the, the consistent or the the rate of change and all that, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, what your thoughts are on, on, on generation flux. I mean, it, it's, uh, I haven't heard, uh, I don't know. I, millennials, uh, the latest generation I've, I've heard of as far as, you know, all the labels that get applied and stuff. But uh, this, uh, this label, I think could apply to a broader uh, kind of a, a, more of a, an application when I when I see the title I, I think of it more of just the okay new set of circumstances for everybody in the workplace uh, be adaptable am I am I can you tell a little bit more about about that book yeah so becoming generation flux uh, was a book I wrote a few years ago and it really is it's a how to navigate your career kind of a book and for me Again, born out of different challenges and frustrations that I've been through in my career, um, really wanting to help others and help them navigate their own career. Um, really, the bottom line is the traditional career advice that has lasted for quite a long time, uh, in, at least in the U.S., has dramatically changed in the last, I would say, 10 years or so. And what used to work before which was find a good company to work for and work for them for 20, 30, 40 years, retire with a good pension or at least some sort of um, benefits or, or, you know, income that, it, that continued after your employment <clears throat> has pretty much gone away. Now, there are certainly some exceptions, government and some other jobs where you can still have a pension. Uh, but I think and I predict that in the coming years, even those – programs that are in place for people today, those promises will not all be there in by the time people do retire, even if you do have a pension plan. So while I say all of that, not to, not to discourage us, uh, but to paint a clear picture of what the future holds, and, and really the future is now. Um, I also talk about education in the book and how that is, higher education specifically, how that's changed dramatically, um, and the increasing costs of higher education. I am neither an advocate for nor an advocate against higher education. I have two higher education degrees, a bachelor's and a, and a master's degree, but and I do believe in that education, but I think we have to be a lot wiser and smarter with the kind of education we get and how much money we spend and the debt into which we go given the type of job we want to get and the income likely that we're going to get out of that career, I think we've got to be a lot more focused on really what's going to provide that return. So um, the same would be, you know, formal education as well as informal education. Um, things, uh, the business environment is changing more and more rapidly. So companies are going out of business more frequently uh, because they're not adapting, um, people are losing their jobs because they're not adapting, or maybe because their business or their organization hasn't adapted, and maybe through no fault of their own in their career. Uh, but really, we need to build this adaptable skill set <clears throat> in order to not just survive, but thrive in our careers going forward. So really that that leads me to a future book that i'm writing called the serial specialist and um you have generally you have two different kinds of people you have people who are specialists they go into a specific area let's say marketing or even deeper i'm going to go into cpg marketing or i'm going to go into direct marketing or uh, some subspecialty of marketing and then focus my whole career in that one area or you have people who are more general, who may spend some time in marketing, but also in accounting or other parts of the business, and they end up 
maybe being CEO someday because they have broad experience in that particular company uh, and they build those skills over time. Uh, but the concept of the serial specialist <clears throat> is a blend of the two. And it's really something that I've come to um, to know and recognize in my own life that we need to build adaptable skills so that we can go into either different industries um, or different <clears throat> departments of business and not just execute at a um, surface level, but be able to dive in and execute at a deep level in each of those areas, which sets it apart from a generalist, because a generalist is more broad and a serial specialist can go deep, but go deep in many different areas. So taking that concept and um, understanding how that applies to you and your situation, um, we have to build adaptable skills that can apply across different industries, different departments in order to uh, to really thrive in the future. No, that that's uh, definitely holds true. I know uh, my dad's path of uh, one company, one job, uh, all the way through the end is uh, clearly not the world we're in today. Um, you know, I'm I'm amazed at how many how many uh, different uh, employers one has uh, anymore. Um, you know, or, or you, you, you see it all the time that people are, are uh, I guess they, they move and they're able to move, you know, their, their skills are whether they're in demand or the, the companies are looking to fill a seat or whatever that might be. Um, but just the, uh, the fluid, the, uh, fluid, fluidity or fluidness. I don't know what the right word is there, but it's a very fluid workplace. Um, that's good. Um, I wanted to ask you just quick about uh, just writing your books in in general. Um, you know, I, I know I've had others that have written books on the on the program, and and uh, I'm kind of curious what what what's been your process. Have you had any uh, significant challenges? Have you have you found uh, uh, you know people are are uh, viewing your you and uh, your work differently now that you you're a published author is it uh what's the the satisfaction of of doing that i i mean i've I've considered it many times and and i'm kind of curious what your take is on that yeah well i'll say one thing first if you or other of your listeners are looking to write a book to make a lot of money um <laughs> it's very likely to happen at least in the short term <laughs> So I don't say that to discourage you or others, because I do think it's very worthwhile for many reasons, and I'll go into a few of those. Um, over the long term, you can build a consistent income um, through book royalties, um, not just by putting the book out there. You still have to market it. You have to build your own personal brand. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, people do look at me differently. They do, do look at uh, my, you know, who I am in my career um, on a different level because I am a published author and, and really not just one book, but three books. And I am, my goal when I wrote the first book was to write at least 10 books. And I'm confident I will far exceed 10 books by the time I'm, I'm dead, hopefully a very long time in the future. <laughs> uh, but for me, um, I plan to do this for the long term. So for me, this is part of sharing my story, sharing my life and helping people in leadership, career, particularly also in marketing. I have um, a job, a day job in digital marketing, helping companies grow their organic traffic through Google. Yes, you can still do that. It just takes a lot more work and time, but you can. Um, and uh, so for me, <clears throat> if you're thinking, if you and others are thinking about writing a book, the best advice I can give you is just write it. Um, you know, don't worry about all of the the marketing. That's certainly a lot of work once you get it written. But most people talk about writing a book and they never actually do it. And I was one of those people. <laughs> so I would encourage anybody listening, if you're thinking about writing a book, just do it. No excuses. I did it. I've read all my books while I've had a day job. And I have a wife and three kids, by the way, who I do pay attention to. <laughs> I have a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, 9-year-old. Uh, 
uh, two boys and a girl, and of course my wife too. That I'm happily married after 17 years, but um, and those take time, investment to keep those relationships um, moving forward. But you can find time. It's just a matter of when to find time, and you have to structure time. For me, one of the best things I can uh, give you and others advice on to get you started with those ideas. If you have an idea, um, I use an app on my Android phone called List Note, which is free. Um, and I, you can dictate, you know, basically talk into your phone and it'll transcribe it right there and then. And then later on, I can cut and paste that um, into another program. And then I can go back and compile those notes and edit them and do all of that, that final stuff that you have to do uh, to, to polish and, and make a book. But just start start with the ideation process whatever ideas you have it doesn't have to be formal you don't even have to have an outline although eventually you will need an outline to help you organize the book um, just get the ideas down on paper and start with that and the more you get in the rhythm of doing that and you get the practice and the it's not necessarily all fun <laughs> it's work uh, but if it's something that you really are passionate about, you either want to share, uh, as, you know, in a nonfiction sense, or if you just want to write fiction books, that's fine too. Uh, but take those ideas that you have and get them down because it, the more I've gotten into the habit of writing those ideas down, as soon as I have them, I'm, I'm, when I look back, I'm glad I did because many times when I've thought those ideas or had ideas for a book or just some ideas floating around my head, I didn't take time to write them down or dictate them into a phone. They're gone. Some of them forever. Some of them come, you know, it takes several years for that to come, and you come back around. I, I will I'll leave you with this on, on the book. Um, the reason for to do are many reasons. One is legacy. Um, you know, these books are helping many, many people in leadership and career, but the, the primary or the first reason I wrote them was for my family, was for my wife and kids, so that someday when I'm gone, they can have that. That's a part of me. The, the, the books that I've written, that's, that's me living and breathing even after I'm gone. And if for no other reason than that, you know, Leave that legacy now. We all don't know how long we're going to live. We all hope we live into the hundreds, but we don't know. And and I got started with writing books rather young. And I I know I'm kind of the exception to the rule for nonfiction, but I recommend there's to to get started today. There's no there's no too young or too old. Just just do it. No, uh, those are uh, powerful words. I. I uh... I would agree uh, uh, wholeheartedly, and and uh, like I said, it's a new year. Good, if it's something you've been thinking about. Why not get started uh, and do it now? I like your uh, your idea about the uh, uh, dictation there too, with the uh, you know the technology is available to transcribe your your uh, audio into the uh, you know written word, where you can actually edit it and stuff. That makes a lot of sense. And like you said, do it now before you forget where you left your keys or or whatever. And, and uh get an interruption or whatever that's a great idea well miles i'm i'm uh looking at the time here we've been kind of going longer it's kind of zoomed by uh but i wanted to ask you before i let you go if there's anything that uh, uh we didn't cover i i i had uh kind of some notes i've kind of drilled down about some things i wanted to talk to you about but i want to make sure we we hit uh if there's anything you wanted to, uh, to mention um well t touching on what you just talked about you know even if you don't want to write books, have no desire to write books, um, that concept can apply to a lot of different things. Maybe you've been thinking about doing something new. You know, it is the new year, uh, trying something, starting something new, whether it's books or some other project or some other entrepreneurial venture. Um, just start small. Don't start, don't think you have to start been on the journey for the last five years it's not about the short-term game and, and for me to get where i want to go which is you know a nationally recognized 
as personnel, for that matter, um, that doesn't happen overnight. And people that are successful, and we think, oh my gosh, you know, they're 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 like super people at a time, just like the rest of us do. I, I do too. too. I'm not anybody special. I mean, I, I know we all have special talents and skills and abilities that we need to use to benefit others in this world, but I'm really not that different than anybody else. And just because somebody is a big name speaker or entrepreneur doesn't mean they don't have issues or challenges or you know shortcomings themselves. And, and it took them, most of them, the vast majority, it took them 10, 20, 30 years of day in, day out, trying new things, doing this differently, doing that, uh, building that over time to where they become quote unquote successful visibly in their career. But many times we miss all of those opportunities that we've had to impact people's lives along the way that could be infinitely more valuable, I would argue, than the visible career success. No, that's uh, well said. And, and uh, you know, again, the reminder that uh, it's rare that anybody has meteor, uh, you know, success uh, without a lot of uh, hard work uh, put in before. I mean, that, you know, it's, that is something that we miss so often, especially in the, this day and age of technology and the ability to see all the, you know, what's hot now, but not understanding, you know, how long they've been working at it kind of thing. So that's, that's all uh, good. Um, Miles, what's the best way for somebody to uh, get in touch with you? Uh, and I'll list it in the show notes, but what, what's uh, the best way for people to get a, get in touch with you? Find me on 